What's going on guys? In this lesson, we'll be looking at how we select and use participants in our psychological research. Wouldn't it be amazing if we could study every person in the world to get a thorough understanding of every possible human behavior? Unfortunately, this just isn't possible. So when selecting participants, we have to be very careful we need to identify the part of the population or target group that we're interested in studying. Now it's unlikely that we can include everyone from that target group, so our sample should be representative or reflect the characteristics found within the group. This will allow for our results to be generalizable to the entire group. This is important because if our sample is not representative, then it is biased and in turn not reliable. There are five main ways of selecting a sample these are random, opportunity, volunteer, systematic, and stratified sampling. Let's take a look at these in a little more detail. Random sampling. Put simply, this method randomly selects members of the target group, giving every member an equal chance of being selected for the sample. The advantage of this method is in its random nature, and as each member has an equal chance of being selected, the sample by design is likely to be representative. The disadvantage kind of lies within the advantage because of the random nature of the selection process. You can inadvertently make a selection which is not representative at all. For example, you may select a single gender or race. Also, if the target audience is large, it may not be practical or possible to give everyone an equal chance of being selected. Opportunity sampling is when researchers use anyone who is willing and able to participate in the study. The advantage of this method lay in its quick and practical way of getting a sample. Disadvantage is, as you probably guessed, that the sample is unlikely to be representative of the, or any target population as a whole, meaning there's no way that we can confidently generalize the findings to our research. But due to its quick and easy nature, this method is often used. Volunteer sampling, Yep, just as you probably guessed, is when the researcher places an ad requesting people to volunteer to participate in the study. Following this process, the researcher may select who they feel to be most suitable for the study. The potential advantage is that if the ad is placed in a place of prominence, many people will see it potentially increasing both numbers and scope of potential participants. This advantage could be the nature of the people who respond to the ad. These people may generally be more cooperative than others thus making the sample unlikely to be representative of the target population. Systematic sampling is where the researcher takes every nth name from a sampling frame, which is a record of names in a population. So for example, every sixth name. An advantage of this method is that it is both a simple and effective way of generating a sample with an element of randomization. There is also a good chance of the population being evenly sampled, unlike other methods. A potential disadvantage is that the subgroups may be missed, and also if the pattern used for sampling coincides with a pattern within the population, it will not be representative. Stratified sampling is where the researcher identifies all of the important subgroups within the population and randomly selects a proportionate number from each to include in the sample. Things such as different ages or ethnicities could be examples. Advantage of this method is that it has a strong likelihood of being a fairly representative sample. Disadvantages include the fact that it is very time consuming and potentially expensive. The researcher may also find it difficult to identify the subgroups and even then it may be possible to miss some. When using human participants, they're usually aware that they're being studied. This knowledge alone may lead to the participants not giving a true response thus rendering their responses neither valid nor reliable. Let's check out some of these effects now. When people are interested in the attention they're receiving, say from the researcher, then it is likely they will try harder at the tasks, in essence showing a more positive response. This is known as the Hawthorne effect and can result in results which are artificially high, thus rendering the researcher's conclusion as invalid. The opposite occurs when the participant is uninterested. Sometimes, when conducting research, Participants form an idea of the study's purpose. If they believe that they know what kind of response the researcher would expect, they may select this type of response to please the researcher, 
or deliberately do the opposite. Either way, any conclusion drawn from the study would be invalid. This is known as demand characteristics. Don't think that it's only the participants who can affect the study in an undesirable way. The researcher can also have an undesirable effect on the outcome of the study, impacting the reliability and validity of the test due to their own expectations. Researcher or experimenter bias is when the expectations of the researcher influence the design of their study and how they behave towards the participants. This bias can be dangerous as it may influence how they take measurements and then analyze their data. Investigator effect is anything that the researcher does that can potentially affect how the participant behaves. For example, a researcher may ask leading questions to the participants. Hopefully this gives you guys a better understanding of how to select and use participants in your psychological research. Remember to like and subscribe. Catch you guys in the next one. Peace.